Now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Ayman Grada. Uh, he is a uh, faculty at, at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. He did his residency at Boston University, uh, as well as a wound fellowship. And he's here to talk about advances in wound healing for the dermatologist. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Chris, for the kind introduction. Uh, Yes, today we're going to talk about advances in wound healing for the dermatologist. So here are my disclosures. There are no relevant conflict of interest. Uh, within 15 minutes, we're going to try to cover uh, the new topical therapies for epidermolysis bullosa. Very exciting news. And if there are a few minutes left, we're going to try to touch on uh, the living cell-based therapy. So let's start at the fundamental level, at the skin anatomy. As you all know, the skin is composed of three main layers, epidermis, dermis, and the subcutaneous uh, tissue. Between the epidermis and dermis, there's a, this thin blue line, what we call the uh, basement membrane zone, and that contains a, the structural proteins that are very important in uh, bringing the skin together. So epidermolysis bullosa, or EAP, it's a group of genetic disorders characterized by recurrent blistering in response to minor trauma. There's a defect on those structural proteins that I talked about. And the recurrent blister oftentimes leads to difficult to treat, very painful chronic wounds. Long-standing chronic wounds increases the risk of squamous cell carcinoma, which is the major cause of death in AB patients along with sepsis, of course. It's a very rare disease. In the US, this is based on the 20, uh, 2002 estimates. The incidence is 20 per million live births, extremely rare. And the prevalence is 11 per million population. However, these patients suffer a lot. It's very painful. Wounds are very complex, notoriously difficult to treat, and there's a huge unmet need. So EB is categorized into three main groups based on the level of the split in the skin. If the split happens in the epidermis, the superficial layer, we call it EB simplex. If the split happens in between the epidermis and dermis, we call it the junctional AB. That's why it's called junctional. If the split happens in the superficial layer of the epidermis, lamina densa, we call it dystrophic EB. In general, junctional and dystrophic EB are the most severe forms of EB. EB simplex tend to be much easier to heal. It's kind of superficial. So here's a depiction. Um, you know, we see at the right side the levels of the split we talked about. Uh, these are some representative photos for uh, EB. This is uh, EB simplex. This is junctional EB, and this is a representation of a uh, dystrophic EB picture. Uh, dystrophic EB is caused by mutation in collagen 7A1, which encodes type 7 collagen. As you know, type 7 collagen is the chief anchoring fibril that connects the epidermis with the dermis. The diagnosis, skin biopsy uh, from the edge of freshly induced blister, then you send it to uh, immunofluorescence testing to confirm the, the subtype of AB. Until recently, the treatment paradigm hinges on preventive measures. Genetic counseling, uh, conventional standard therapy, which is dressing, uh, infection control, pain control, and nutritional support. However, the good news, 2023 was phenomenal in the wound space. Two newly approved drugs for AB by the FDA. The first one, it was just approved recently, it's called Birch Triterpenase. It's such a mouthful name, a mouthful name for a complex wound. Uh, so these are both topical gels, uh, and the second one is Bermagene Gaperpavec, or BVEC. It's another topical gene, but this one is, um, it's a gene therapy. It's a topical gene therapy. Uh, so Birch triterpenase is indicated for uh, patients, adult and pediatric patients with 
junctional and dystrophic AB six months of, uh, uh, of age and older. Uh, for the BVEC, it's indicated only for dystrophic AB. So here are the trials, uh, the pivotal trials that are the basis of the FDA approval. For the first one, it's called also oleogel. It's a much easier name than Birch triterpenase. So it's one phase three study uh, that uh, included, uh, I would say first, let's, let's understand what's this oleogel. The oleogel is a 10% Birch triterpenase, which is basically a cocktail of naturally occurring ingredients. It has shown to, has, uh, to uh, have uh, antimicrobial properties and also to promote wound healing through activation of keratinocyte differentiation and migration. The study design included 223 patients in, from 26 countries. We know how challenging our rare disease studies. Um, so uh, one group received the active treatment, the other group received the control vehicle. Uh, both groups also received the standard conventional dressing. The primary endpoint is the proportion of patients with complete wound closure within the first 45 days. Baseline characteristics, here you can see that a majority of the subjects were pediatric, less than 18 years old, and the most common variant was the dystrophic AEB. Here are the efficacy data. Uh, the primary endpoint was met. To the left side, you see the uh, subjects who received oleogel, 43, 41% of those subjects uh, achieved the primary endpoint uh, as compared to uh, the control gel, uh, statistically st significant difference. A subgroup analysis was done to kind of understand how the active treatment performed and uh, different subtypes of EB. And, um, you know, uh, you can see here that uh, there's a statistically significant difference between the active control and uh, the control gel, sorry, the active treatment and the control gel in the recessive dystrophic AB, and, but no stats significant difference in the subjects who had the dystrophic EB or the junctional AB. But, you know, we understand the nuance. The sample size is really small. It's not well controlled to detect the difference. So you can take this with a grain of salt. But in general, the primary endpoint was met. Uh, in regards to safety, uh, adverse events were primarily mild to moderate in intensity. And there were no clinically significant difference between the active treatment group, the oleogel group, and uh, uh, the control group. So here's how you apply this gel. You uh, apply it directly, one millimeter directly onto, into the wound, or you can also apply it on the dressing surface that will be in contact with the wound. Uh, the second uh, FDA approved drug we talked about is the BVEC. This is a topical gene therapy. Uh, was, the study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine last year. and. Um, uh, first of all, let's understand the MOA. What's the BVEC? It's a non-invasive topical redosable gene therapy. It uses a modified harmless version of herpes simplex virus as a vector to deliver two healthy copies of the collagen 7A1 gene directly into the skin cells in the wounds. So this harmless vector does not alter uh, the DNA. It does not replicate into, uh, in the skin cells. So the goal is for this delivered gene to allow skin cell to produce a functional copies of the collagen 7 protein, which is the problem in dystrophic EB. So the trial is an intrapatient double-blind randomized controlled trial. In each patient, each for to, to be eligible for this trial, each patient has to have at least two wounds, uh, so because it's intrapatient, so the active treatment would be applied in, on one wound and then the placebo and the other one in the same patient. So here's the study design. The patient has to be at least six months uh, of age, confirmed dystrophic AB, and two cutaneous wounds similar in size, appearance, and anatom anatomical region. The primary endpoint is the, achieving, uh, the achievement of complete wound closure uh, at six months. The secondary endpoint is the achievement of complete wound closure at three months. 
baseline characteristics similar to the previous trial, mostly uh, children. Uh, the efficacy data here, you can see uh, a greater proportion of patients who received the BVEC achieved the primary endpoint, around 67%, versus 22% uh, in the placebo group. Uh, so the primary endpoint, again, is achievement of complete wound closure at six months. The secondary endpoint is achievement of complete wound closure at two, three months, and you can see a greater proportion of patients achieve the endpoint um, compared to the placebo. Safety data, no major problems. Uh, adverse events were mi mainly mild to moderate. There are three squamous cell carcinoma cases reported. But none of these cases were uh, located on the wounds that were exposed to BVEC or placebo. So in conclusion, it achieved the endpoint check mark. These are uh, representative pictures of, the, of the, the patients who received the BVEC at different time points from baseline to six months and uh, different wound sizes. You can see there's noticeable um, uh, improvement in wound closure uh, at six months compared to placebo. So how do you apply this wound? Uh, this treatment specifically has to be administered by a healthcare professional. It cannot be done by the patient. A healthcare professional have to use a syringe, apply several drops, evenly spaced, one centimeter apart uh, on, on the wound. All right, so I think we have a few minutes. Let's talk about the living cell-based therapy. Um, I'm sure you heard about Aplograph. It's not, it's an old news, right? But this is just a refresher. Um, so uh, it's a bilayered skin construct composed of uh, type one, bovine type one collagen cultured in male neonatal uh, dermal fibroblast and keratinocyte. So it's a skin substitute. Um, so it's FDA approved for both venous lug ulcers and diabetic foot ulcers. For uh, venous lug ulcers, it's indicated, uh, along with standard compression therapy, in venous ulcers of at least one month of duration that has not responded to conventional standard therapy. For uh, the DFUs, it's indicated with conventional care and the treatment of full thickness neuropathic uh, diabetic foot ulcer of greater than three weeks of duration. Um, you know, which extends through the dermis, but not the tendons, muscles, capsules, or bone exposure. And here's how you apply it. You know, uh, you bring a Q-tip, you apply the aplograph, and you try to kind of make sure that it's in close contact with the wound bed. So the pivotal trials uh, were prospective uh, parallel group randomized control trials enrolled 240 patients in 15 centers. This is for the venous leg ulcers. And you can see here from the results, uh, subjects who received uh, the BSC plus conventional therapy performed better than conventional therapy alone. It's statistically significant difference. Uh, and also the median time for wound closure uh, was less, 99 days versus 184 days. Uh, and the, the primary endpoint is complete closure uh, after 24 weeks. Uh, it has shown to be more effective uh, in long-standing venous lug ulcers. So in patients with venous ulcers for at least one year of duration, 47% uh, of wound closure was achieved, uh, 47 of patients achieved wound closure at week 24 compared to 19% with just compression alone. Um, for the diabetic foot ulcer, we see consistent results as, you know, compared to the venous uh, also results, so more patients who received this uh, bilayer skin construct achieved wound closure. And the primary endpoint here is at week 12, uh, with the venous ulcer trial is 24 weeks or six months. And um, now we talked about wound healing, but what happens when there's an excessive healing? With excessive healing, we get scars, and that's where my friend, uh, Dr. Brian Berman, is going to teach us about scars. Thank you very much. 